Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being patient with our technical difficulties. I'm Amy Latessa from IT at UC Research and Development, and I want to thank you all for being here today. I'm thrilled to present George Turner, the Chief Systems Architect for Research Technologies at the Pervasive Technologies Institute at Indiana University. I'm not quite sure how my team or the University of Cincinnati got so lucky, but George has been an invaluable, generous, and fundamental sage, assisting us to set up the Advanced Research Computing Cluster, UC's first central high-performance computing cluster. As several people in this room can verify, I don't think it would be possible without him, and his lecture will demonstrate his wealth of knowledge and experience in all things research computing. I can answer questions about uh, the new system and workshops after this talk, uh, but without further ado, the Data and Computational Science series presented by UC Libraries and IT at UC R&D and supported by a Universal Provider Award from UC's Office of the Provost is honored to have George Turner, the research computing grand poobah, <laughs> and we thank him for being here today. Take it away, George. Thank you. Thank you. So um, today's talk is Research Computing, A View from the Trenches. I've been involved in research computing now since uh, uh, 1983 is when I started. So I, I, you know, I'm an astrophysicist by training. I can do calculus on the complex plane, but fourth grade arithmetic causes problems. So whatever 2019 minus 1983 was, is. So... Um, I work for an organization, um, Research Technologies, I'll get to that slide in a bit, but Research Technologies is a division under University Information Technology Services. So that's equivalent to your uh, IT at UC, okay? Um, there's four primary, uh, five primary divisions. You have research computing, you have the administrative computing which does the grades and the paychecks and all that kind of stuff. We have a support group. Uh, we have a networking group. Um, so uh, we're just one part of this larger organization, UITS. Um, research technologies, that's who we are. Um, you can see from this slide that uh, some of the services that we provide, consulting, uh, compute and storage, uh, research software, visualization. Uh, and training and outreach. So um, I'll dive deeper into this uh, as we go along. Now Research Technologies has sort of a, a, a unique uh, position. There's this thing called the Pervasive Technology Institute. So it's a, a, there's about seven or eight different groups within UITS. Some are academic. Uh, we're a service provider. We provide services to the university and to the nation. Um, but uh, we're a subset of this umbrella organization called uh, Pervasive Technology Institute. Um, oops. Uh, and here's a list of some of those um, uh, groups. Uh, we have the Center for Applied Cybersecurity. That's a famous one that's NSF funded. They provide uh, cybersecurity services for um, national resources. Um, data to insight, sort of how do you take data and work it to make it um, become knowledge. A couple of pretty, um, uh, that you may have heard, the Hathi Trust, they have uh, uh, digitized lots of copyrighted materials, bazillions of books, and so if you do research on text, uh, you can use uh, their services to get access to these texts. Um, and they have technology so that you can't like screen scrape or download the text or things like that. Uh, another really uh, famous one is if we have any biologists that does genomics or proteomics in the room. Uh, the National Center for Genome Analysis Support, that's a group uh, that's funded by the National Science Foundation and their job is to just support uh, people doing uh, genomics and proteomics and those kinds of things nationwide. Their services are free. Um, they have a lot of these um, uh, introductory classes, so they have a uh, Linux 101, they have a Python 101, they provide uh, tutorials and uh, support. They, um, if you're installing uh, like Galaxy or Trinity or some of these bioinformatics software, they will work with you and help you get that installed. Uh, so again, 
anybody doing bioinformatics really needs to know about them. Um, and then, of course, here's research technologies. Um, uh, just a couple of uh, side players that I have to mention. The global knock. Research computing depends on networks both within the system, within the room, within the university, and around the world. So we work uh, it's sort of a left brain, right brain operation with the global knock. Global knock is uh, um, situated at Indiana University. They control these networks around the world. So on the map you see that's Internet 2, which connects all of the major research organizations in the United States. Uh, they manage networks, the, the Pac-10, so that's the network that goes from Seattle and San Diego to the Pacific Rim. Uh, they manage the network that goes from New England over to Europe. Uh, they manage several state levels, so you're probably familiar with ORNET. So they manage um, the networks for um, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, uh, Indiana. And there's a, a group down in the, the southeast, Georgia, South Carolina. Uh, there's a network down there. So there's about 20 different networks that they manage around the world. Um, and then uh, Exceed, if you've not heard of Exceed, they, um, the National Science Foundation provides money to, to purchase hardware and resources. Exceed is the entity that allocates that. So I'll be talking about Jetstream here in a bit, or you may already have heard about Jetstream. This was a, na uh, a resource that was funded by the National Science Foundation. They gave us the money to buy the hardware, and then we, excuse me, we make it available to the user community, and it's Exceed that out provides allocations on that service. Okay, so this is a machine that IU manages but is available to the uh, national infrastructure. Most of the systems I'm going to be talking about today, uh, this is different than, uh, Jetstream is different than our local resources. Uh, at IU we have a long history of free, open, and equal access to research um, uh, computing facilities. Uh, that, it, that includes compute resources, storage resources, viz resources, um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. But anyways, exceed resources are free. So a lot of times all you have to do to get started on these systems is to provide a, a request a startup allocation. And for that, you only need uh, three or four sentences about what you want to do, what your research is, uh, a Vita, and that's it. So. Um, these are national resources that you can be using now for free. Um, historically, Exceed has um, funded these giant supercomputer resources. So really the people that would be using that type of resource uh, is only about 3% of the, the researchers supported by the National Science Foundation. But I'll get into that in just a little bit. But Exceed is somebody you need to be aware of. So the origin of research computing um, at Indiana University back in 1949, um, so this is shortly after the, the Second World War, um, they had what they called the, uh, the IBM 602 calculating punch. So and this wouldn't even count as a calculator today. So it's a punch card thingy that could do calculations. And so um, when you're looking to put in, uh, put in hardware, you gotta put it somewhere. So they put it in the same room as the administrative computing, but their, their computers were nothing like what we have today. Essentially, about the only thing they could do was uh, sort, is about the only thing they could do, okay? Store information and sort. So along comes the Korean War, and the Selective Service uh, Agency needed to know students' GPAs. Well, this calculating punch could actually do divisions. So all of a sudden, it became high demand. So. Um, during the day, the registrar's office would, from 8 to 5 would use the calculating punch and then the researchers got access to it uh, from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock the next morning. So our, our president at that time, um, uh, President Wells, he, he liked to roam around campus and drop in on uh, labs and things like that. He was very in touch with what was going on uh, at, at the university. So he would stop in late at night and, and just sort of, you know, hang out with the researchers that were using um, uh, the calculating punch. So in 1953, uh, during his State of the University uh, speech, he said, he put down the mandate that we need to start investing uh, in research computing. 
So that led to a year later, a committee was formed. Um, essentially, these uh, three gentlemen that you see listed here um, uh, formed a, a computing committee and came up with uh, some recommendations. So, two of the recommendations is that uh, research computing equipment should be uh, operated on an open shop basis. So again, you have to go back to the 50s, and if you think about how machine shops work or something like this, uh, people should be able to stop by this room where this computer is and be able to use it, okay? And uh, also that computing services should be available to all researchers, including those who could not fund it um, themselves, okay? So this is sort of the beginning of this open, free, and equal access that I was mentioning. Um, one of the other recommendations was to purchase uh, an IBM. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But the first uh, director of research computing was an astronomy professor, and he modified those two um, uh, comments just a little bit. So you can imagine this computer just drops in the middle of the university, 1955. Um, if you've ever been around uh, faculty members, uh, they have a tendency to think that their work is the most important and everybody else is at a secondary level. So Marshall Rubel, now I heard this story as an undergraduate astrophysics student, okay? decades before I ever started doing supercomputing. So it's, it's legend amongst the students, uh, astronomy students at IU, that Marshall Rubel stood up and said, look, the activities that everybody at this university is engaged in are all valid, so everybody gets free, open, and equal access, including my undergraduate astronomy students. So since I was an undergraduate astronomy student, that's stuck in my mind. So anyways, that's, that's the history, and then to this day, um, that's the way computing is. We look at um, research, infra, uh, research computing infrastructure uh, as infrastructure, very much like a library. So if you're a student or a faculty member, you need um, books or something from the library, you just go and you utilize it. So it's just part of the infrastructure of Indiana University. Um, and as you might uh, guess, that took, um, this was a quote from that time. Um, at that, um, IU was one of the few universities that had free access and that it took a great deal of support from the campus administrators and that's still true today. So um, one of the hurdles, well not a hurdle, but um, one of the things that UC is working on now is uh, gaining the support from the administrator. I think the support's there, but under getting them to understand um, what is needed to get from where we are to where we want to be. And I use that we because I consider myself part of this UC team. Um, even though I'm from Indiana University, uh, what they're trying to do here is very valuable. Um, I know I personally know the value of what's trying to be done and I uh, consider it a privilege to be uh, part of this. So, um, Most of this is actually accessories to the uh, first computer, the IBM 650. Um, this is part of the 650 and there's a couple of more cabinets that are not in this picture but that's the actual computer. Okay, they always take pictures, uh, it seems like, of the tape drives and blinky lights and things like that. So um, the tape drives, uh, in the next slide I'll, I'll get into this a little bit. But um, so here you have the tape drives. This is a spinning disc or a spinning drum. So you have spinning, you may be old enough to remember spinning discs. Well, they used to be drums, so you had a lot of heads along the drum. And as the drums spin around, you had to wait for your data to come around. Um, this is a key punch, uh, there's a printer somewhere, maybe in the next, but a couple interesting points. It had 2K of memory, okay? I got 32 gigabytes on my keychain, okay? <laughs> so they had 2,000 words. Now that 2,000 words is split between your program and the data of, that your program uses, okay? so. Um, a thousand vacuum tubes that generated so much heat that they had to take into special considerations. I'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, we were talking uh, uh, with a vendor yesterday about 
uh, what, what the next cluster here at UC might look like. And I swear one third of the conversation was about heat and power. And what was it going to take? What form could we put it in that could um, the um, uh, facilities here could handle? So um, we're still fighting that battle. Um, some of these computer racks, um, if you've ever seen a computer rack, they're like 20 inches wide, about yay high. Uh, a lot of those pull about 18 kilowatts. So your house setting on the street pulls about one kilowatt just sitting there. Now, if you turn on an electric stove or something like that, that's a little bit. But just average over a 24-hour period, your house is pulling a kilowatt. So one rack the size of a refrigerator is pulling the equivalent of 17, 18 houses. That's pretty much both sides of a block. Okay, The newer technologies that are coming out um, pull double that, so about 30 to 35 kilowatts. Um, I'll mention Big Red 2, that's a system we have. I have an interesting ooh-ah statistic on that. But, um, so here's a, actually a better picture of the computer. These, you can see these tall racks. That's actually the IBM. This is a spinning disk. Uh, and again, the tape drives you saw earlier. Um, what's uh, cool about the, um, that spinning disk, and we mentioned it here, is that um, instead of 2,000K, they bumped it up to uh, 20K. So 10 times by putting that disk in there, that, or I'm sorry, I'm dating myself, by putting that drum in there, uh, they, could do, they could store 10 times as much. And they also increased the performance uh, by 60% because they could store the data on the tape drives. Okay, So it, it was just a different era at that time. Um, moving up to today, this is the IU Data Center. Uh, it was 10 years old on Tuesday. Um, it's buried sort of halfway underground and all the dirt that they pulled out um, was piled up against the side of the building. These are native prairie grasses from the Midwest here. The walls and the ceiling are 18 inch thick reinforced concrete. This building can take a direct hit from an F5 tornado and survive. Yes, sir? Just a question from the house here. That whole building is your data center? Uh, I wish I had a diagram that showed it on uh, how it's split up, but imagine a rectangle. So the first third of that has three pods. Fire alarm? Oh, okay. Well, that's where you want to be if a tornado is coming. Um, so the, okay, the first third of that building it has three pods in it. We call them research pods. So the entire building is 88,000 square feet. Uh, each pod is 11,000 square feet, and so we have 33,000 square feet where we can install computer hardware. And essentially that means we've got a raised floor. Our raised floor is about three and a half feet high, uh, which if you're as old as I am and you've got to get up under there and pull cables, it's really nice. Um, the, uh, so we have three pods. Two are actually in use. The, uh, one pod is where all the enterprise computing is, uh, takes place. Uh, I like to say it has the most important computer. That's the one that prints my paycheck. Uh, also has my student grades in there too. Um, but it's also, um, this is a pretty unique facility. We were fortunate to build it when we did. Uh, if we had waited a couple of more years, well actually Notre Dame, uh, they were like a year or two behind in us deciding about needing to build another data center and they actually put most of their stuff up in the cloud. So we made a decision to actually invest in real hardware. So, yes sir? Who paid for the building, George? Uh, I'm not sure. They had a war fund. They built money up over time. We knew that we had to do this. I wish I had a picture of the old buildings. The old buildings were a school that was actually built back in the... Um, uh, 60s, and if you ever heard about the open education concept from that time, I see a couple of people in here that might not remember that. They would have these giant classrooms, and there would be no walls or partitions between the classes, okay? And so you'd have Mrs. Smith, third grade class here, and Mrs. Jones's fourth grade class over here. And you can imagine that didn't work very long, and it didn't last very long. So, um, Anyways, this was an old building. Uh, it was just steel girders that had limestone panels uh, hanging on the side of it. So if a tornado had come through there, it would have just blown it all out. So we've known for 
15 years before we built this that we needed it. So I'm sure some of the funds probably just came from the president itself. But I, I'll, I'll look that up for you. Um, anyways, um, so we have one-third uh, the um, enterprise side. Uh, it also functions as the emergency backup site for the state government. So they have a hot site there. If something was to happen to Indianapolis's data center, they're up and running instantly in this data center. Uh, same way for uh, Indiana he University Health. It's just it has nothing to do with Indiana University. It's the group of hospitals in Indiana. Okay, so they have. I don't know if it's their backup site or if that's actually where they run operations out of. Um, and then two other state universities uh, use this site. Uh, Ball State and Indiana State University actually run their administrative computing out of the administration side. The other side is the research computing uh, pod. Um, there's uh, between the uh, administrative side uses one megawatt of power. The research computing side uses two megawatts of power. Okay, we have two one and a half megawatt generators, so if we lose power, we've got enough power to uh, stay up and running. Um, it's interesting, uh, it takes uh, 10 seconds for the generators to come up and stabilize. If only one of those generators comes up, power will be fed to the enterprise side and the research side is going to crash. Okay, we just use so much power, there's no way that you know we could run on ups. Uh, the UPSs we have are kinetic energy devices, so it's a spinning, it's got a motor slash alternator in it. So if you have electricity, it spins up a flywheel. Um, if you lose power, it takes that momentum from the spinning flywheel and converts it back into electricity. So we have 20 seconds of electrical power for those generators to come up. So, um, yeah, this is a really good investment that IU made. It's going to help us for decades and decades and decades. It also allows us to go after some of these national research grants uh, that I've been mentioning. Um, there's two types of supercomputers. Well, there's more than that, but there's two main types of supercomputers. Uh, there's the large distributed memory systems, and that's essentially what the ARC is, the Advanced Research Computing Cluster. Um, so, um, and then there are large, which, 20 years ago it sort of made sense. Anymore it doesn't really make sense. There's what you call the shared memory systems. Now essentially every server is a shared memory system. What it is is you have a large chunk of memory and you have a lot of computing cores. And any core can access any address uh, in that server, in that memory range. Okay, um, These can be very expensive to build very big. Um, the distributed memory systems, what you do is you take and cut up the memory and you give each processor part of the memory and then if this processor needs to access memory that another processor has it has to send a message down there and say hey I want this piece of information and then it has to send it back. So the basis of research computing or high performance computing you're always dealing with two things bandwidth and latency. How long does it take to get a zero link message from one point to another, and then how much data can you send? So now this could be within the server, it could be across the global networks or whatever. In, in research computing, we're always battling this bandwidth and latency issue, and it's actually latency is what will kill you. Um, anyways, at IU we have two large distributed memory systems um, at this point in time. We have Big Red 2 and Big Red 2 Plus. Now this is sort of dated. Um, Big Red 2 has already been shut down as of a couple weeks ago. Big Red 2 Plus has now been uh, called, um, actually this slide wrong, Big Red 2 has been named, renamed Big Red 3. So that's essentially Big Red 2 Plus was turned into Big Red 3. Excuse me, I have problems keeping track. The marketing folks keep changing it on us, okay? so. Uh, Big Red 3 was essentially just an upgrade. Uh, these, I will provide these slides, so if you want to see the gory details, that's why I put the details on here and you can look them up, okay? They're, they're not really important except to a few select people. Um, and also, if you go to this URL, there's more descriptive. 
So anyways, this is sort of Big Red 3 is just to get us through till January when Big Red 200 comes on. So our original Big Red 1, um, they use how many brain scans could be processed simultaneously. Uh, they're saying uh, uh, 1.3 uh, 1 thousand. So Big Red 2, which we just shut down, okay, this system was stood up in 2005. 2012, um, they're saying we could do 7,000. So that's you know, eh, five times as much. Okay, Big Red 200, which will come online in January, is able to do uh, essentially 10 times what uh, the, the one we just shut down. So this is our new system that will be coming out. Uh, it's a Cray Shasta system, and it will be serial number one. So we will have the first Cray, uh, Shea, Cray Shasta supercomputer with a Dragonfly um, interconnect. Other compute resources. So that was the big. When I th think of high performance computing, these people are. are they're looking to squeeze every bit of performance out of this computer that they can get. And this is where bandwidth and latency is important. These people actually count clock ticks, okay? It takes one clock tick, well, a computer runs at, say, 2.4 gigahertz, okay? So you got 2.4 billion clock ticks per second. These people, to do a, uh, an add or a subtract takes one clock tick. A multiply takes five to seven clock ticks. A division takes 15 to 20 clock ticks, okay? So if you can convert a division into a multiplication, I leave it as a you know, fifth grade exercise to how you do that, okay? You have just sped up your computer, I mean your program, by a good bit, okay? If you get into um, some of the transcendental functions like a, a square root or a, a sine or cosine function, these can take 50 to 200 clock ticks, okay? So, um, and if you start moving data from memory down to the cores, that can take hundreds of clock ticks. So, part of the black magic of research computing, high performance computing, is knowing how to write your programs so that the compilers that take and convert your Fortran or C or whatever it is into machine instructions. The black magic in these compilers is what really makes these things sing, okay? Because they can do, um, they, it's called optimization. And so um, they, the compiler can guess what you're going to do next. So it starts pulling data down, pulls it into the cache. You may have heard about this CPU has so much cache, okay? So it only takes uh, scores of clock ticks to pull data from cache, where it takes hundreds of clock ticks to pull it from memory. And if you're going over the network, remember how I talked about the message passing from one server to the next? That can take thousands of clock ticks. Okay, so staging your memory and staging your instructions, this, uh, your computer program also goes through these same problems. So if you, if, for those that people that know um, languages, you can have an if-then-else uh, structure. So if this is true, I want to do this code, else do this code, okay? So a lot of times the compiler will guess, well, it, the human put this if part first because they expected it to be executed more times than the else. So they will actually start pulling instructions down and start pulling data down, anticipating that that's going to be the right answer. And if, you, if it guessed wrong, it like has to throw all that data away, and now you're back up to the hundreds of clock ticks or thousands to pull in the data you actually need. Just as a brief side note, it's this speculative ed, uh, execution. You may have heard about the meltdown and the spectra, these computer or flaws in the Intel chips. That's what's going on. So you, the, the chip has started actually pulling down this data, and it's in cache. And then, oops, I don't need it anymore. So there's a brief moment in time where a hacker or somebody else running on that computer can actually look at that memory. They should not be able to look at that memory. And so there could be things like uh, security keys or crypto codes or stuff like that. So if you ever hear about Spectra uh, and Meltdown, that's what this is. But it's related to this optimization that we're trying to squeeze as much performance out of these chips as we possibly can. 
Anyways, that has nothing to do with this. Um, Okay, I I was describing the large distributed memory system. We also have um, more uh, serial, it could be called serial processing or uh, high throughput computing or um, uh, I call this research computing. That's other distributed computing, I call that high performance. But those terms are used interchangeably. so anyways, CARS is sort of like available to the general masses. They don't need to do that very big complicated programming. Matter of fact, they probably don't know how. A lot of them are probably just running MATLAB or they have a little R program that somebody gave them. Um, and so they just need access to processors. Okay, so CARS is our main system for everybody at IU, okay? Uh, Carbonate, uh, there are people that need large memory. Uh, particularly the machine learning folks and um, the biologists, the proteomists and uh, genomicists. They have, oh, I just love picking on genomicists. I hope there's none in the room here. But um, what they do is, you know, they have these uh, sequencers, and so they sequence like DNA or RNA or proteins or whatever. And so they have these little files that'll have maybe three or four of the amino acids in it. And they have literally thousands of these little files, you know, that the sequencer has chopped up and, and sequenced. So what they're doing with the computers is building this puzzle back out. So what they do is they put 44,000 files in one directory, and then when they do a directory on that directory, it you know takes 10 minutes to come back, and it's like, well, your computer is really bad, and it doesn't work, and you know you got to. The artificial intelligence folks are now getting worse because what they do is they have a million pictures of cats all in one directory, and so. Um, you could, if you do things wrong, well, they say it takes a, a, a human can mess up. It takes a computer to really screw it up. Anyway, um, so anyways, carbonate and carbonate deep learning have lots of memory in them because uh, a lot of times the biologist code needs a lot of memory, but they only need one core. So it's sort of useless to have cars, which has lots of cores with a balanced memory set. Let's put these uh, people that need this type of architecture off by itself. So we had part of the discussions on the uh, new cluster that uh, we're talking about getting, uh, we're going to actually include some large memory nodes to start um, addressing some of these needs here at, at UC. Um, one of the really cool things, really popular things at IU, and I have heard demands uh, from UC uh, faculty members uh, on this, is actually putting a desktop on front of our supercomputers. Okay, we call it RED, the, well, RED's at IU all over the place, but the research desktop. So if you just look at some of the things that it has, um, I'll, I'll, a couple of slides here, I'll talk about some of our storage devices, but there's an icon here that, okay. Um, there's icons here that make these uh, research storage devices look like local devices on your desktop, just like your Mac or your Windows laptop, okay? There are scripts or, um, that allow you to create scripts that you can submit to the batch job or batch cycle. Um, the one thing I did hear about the, um, the needs here at UC is that they want to be able to do both Windows and Linux. We only do Linux. Windows is sort of... You know, it's easy to do things on Linux, but Windows becomes very complicated. And historically, there's been licensing issues and stuff, so there's just no work that really goes on in that. Over on the administrative side, the people that do the teaching in the classrooms and stuff like that, they have the stuff. But in research computing, we don't necessarily deal with it that way. But this has turned out to be extremely popular. Uh, this slide doesn't show it, but uh, six months ago we had 15 servers running this. We're up to about 45 now. So in six months, well, I've had to put on three times as many servers to support this. Uh, this is just more of what I was already talking about. Storage resources. Um, there's three primary. The research home directories, um, these are like when you log in to your laptop, you have a C drive or uh, wherever your account is on your laptop. 
that's what the home directories are. We try to keep these small and on low performance uh, file systems because we don't want users pounding. We don't want users to put their data in the home directory and then start reading from a thousand nodes on the cluster because you will just kill poor performance. Um, that's a problem we have right now with uh, UC's ARC. Um, we don't have the parallel uh, system workbench space. Uh, so the scratch space slash workbench, I like calling it workbench because scratch sort of sounds like, you know, bad connotations. But um, if you hear somebody talking about scratch, it's a workbench. Essentially, it's a place to put your data and work on it. And it's designed to have thousands of nodes accessing that data. Your home directories are not set up there to do that. The main thing with your home directories is it's backed up, okay? Your source code, the results of your computation, things like that. Important things go in your home directory, but it's not a workbench space. We also have the scholarly data archive. This is a tape device. Um, we're up to 80 petabytes of capacity now. Um, we, we have discussed this uh, with the um, research computing um, committee. Uh, we understand the need for it, but it's a second, if not third tier acquisition. Um, there's a great demand we keep hearing um, from the uh, UC faculty that I need a place to store data. and. That's what they're talking about is an archive type storage. It's tape based. So remember I was talking about bandwidth and latency. Latency is measured in minutes. So if I want a file, it may take minutes to get, but I can put petabytes of data there. So um, there's these trade-offs. Okay. Uh, this is more or less just a repeat of uh, what I've been saying. I have mentioned Jetstream. I want to talk a little bit about Jetstream. Um, everything I was talking about before are IU resources, so anybody at IU has access to them. Jetstream is not an IU resource, it is a national resource. You can get an account on it. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, this is what the long tail of science, I don't know if, you, if you've heard of this, but remember I was talking about there's like 3% of the researchers that know how to program these really large systems. So they have a really large problem size, but there's very few capable users of doing that kind of work, okay? And 97% of the rest of the researchers do not do that. They just, that's not their thing, okay? These are the people that need something a little more than a laptop, but they don't need a full supercomputer, okay? So Jetstream was designed to take on those users. And I bet everybody in this room can come up with a, a reason to use Jetstream. The original idea was that, um, uh, that just shows more or less the in, uh, infrastructure. The idea is that, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a, a library and that domain researchers and domain software developers would create the software, install the software on a VM. Like I'm an astronomer, okay? So there are certain things, programs that we have out there that measure the brightness of stars or calculate certain uh, uh, orbital motions and things like that. So there's a VM in there with this astronomy software already installed on it. So I can go there and double click on it and up pops a virtual machine and it'll look just like your desktop, okay, on your laptop. And this software is already professionally installed and all debugged or whatever. And I just start using it, okay. Um, so for Jetstream, we're not only should, are there pre-existing software packages, but we're also looking for people to take their software and install it on here and, and support their communities. Um, Coming back to this picture, I was describing earlier how we, we have to deal with heat. Uh, this is an infrared picture of Jetstream, and this is a, just a regular, you know, regular um, picture of Jetstream. Also, you can see the inside of the data center here. So the Jetstream is probably setting about halfway, and so we have about half of our uh, system open right now. But uh, these doors on the back actually have water uh, running through them. Uh, we have a chilled water loop under the floor. So they're just like the radiator on your car. So we can actually take out more heat 
um, then is generated within the rack. You can see here in the front we have uh, the cold aisle. Usually when you set up these computer rooms you set up a cold aisle and then a hot aisle. So you'll have the back of two hot computers facing each other and then the front will have two cold aisles sucking the cold air up. So these water, these uh, water chilled doors can actually take out more heat than we produce. Um, but these infrared pictures you can sort of see that this is cool and this is hot. So this would be the side of the machine. Uh, this is where that cooling radiator is. Um, right here in back of this system there is nothing but right over here there's another computer blowing hot air onto the back of this system. So that's why it looks... Um, another sort of interesting feature, look how you can see the cold grating where the cold air is coming up the velocity of the air coming up is so fast that it actually blows by the lower computers and gets sucked into these middle computers. We also have a problem where hot air will go out the back and will travel underneath the racks and it'll come up out front. So there's a lot of engineering that goes into you know setting up. This is why when people set up computers in their closets in the department they're creating really bad problems. So. I'll climb down off that soapbox. <laughs> um, research technologies, well, I'm just taking a long time here. Um, our mission is to support research. We don't necessarily do research. Our mission is to make your job easier, faster. Okay, We provide the resources and we provide the people. It is as much the people as it is the hardware resources that we provide. Uh, this is just sort of a, a list of the uh, services that we provide. We've talked about visualization, computing and storage, uh, research software. We have a couple of groups that uh, support uh, developers developing their code. They take the program that they're already running and make it parallelized uh, to use t uh, take advantage of uh, parallelization. We have a large outreach. Um, actually, a lot of the work that I do coming over uh, to UC could be considered under outreach. Um, we have worked for years to get our systems up to the ability that a researcher uh, can uh, handle HIPAA and FISMA data on those systems. Okay? What's, what's, the, what's the, the obstacle there to being able to do that? Is it administrative? I mean, is it, is it organizational or is it? What we had, for, okay, there's a couple of different viewpoints that you have to look at this from. Um, from a sysadmin standpoint, it, uh, we already were doing 85% of what we needed to do. We just needed to document it. Mm -hmm. And then the other 15%, we needed to tighten up or act a little bit. Okay, the other side of the equation is that. Um, it's the researchers data, it is their responsibility to handle, to use the tools that we provide so that that data is right. So um, uh, I would say it took us five, seven years to get ourselves, you know, well some systems came on earlier, some have been later, but um, it's a, um, well we got a day job so it's not like this is the only thing we did, but it took a lot of effort to, to get that. And I already hear, you know, in these uh, meetings with faculty is like, well, I've got HIPAA data, can you support it? Um, I'm not mentioning ITAR, which is export restricted stuff. Um, UC does a lot of engineering work, so there are people that want to handle ITAR data. And um, essentially you have to build a second cluster. So we're building the first cluster, we're trying to meet the greatest need at the university. But, you know, right there in the back of our brain is we got to build a, a, an ITAR cluster. Uh, another thing um, uh, about ITAR is that these large storage systems, you'll have hundreds or maybe thousands of disks in there. If one piece of ITAR data hits that storage system, every one of those disks has to be um, ground up. So those are sort of the issues. So that's why you don't want this ITAR stuff on your big general access system because you're supporting tens of thousands of people and you got you know maybe a handful of, of people doing ITAR and so it's expensive but it's worth worth doing. Um, as far as uh, we partner with faculty members 
to help them uh, get the grants. So over uh, 52 grants, over $51 million over 10 years. Um, that is not our funding. Um, I don't know if I have it in the slide or not, but I think it was $58 million we pulled in last year. Okay, w not we. Researchers at IU brought in $58 million. They use our systems. So there's some software, XD mod, where we can take the, their usage and, and correlate uh, with the databases that uh, grants and research administration have. And so that's how we make that comparison. This goes down the line. We can turn around to the president of the university and say, these people are bringing in the money into the university. Why can't we have some of that overhead? And so that's how we've changed our funding. Uh, model used to be we depended upon the goose that lays these golden eggs to fly over and they'd drop one in our lap about every five to seven years you know here's ten million dollars here's twelve million dollars and so if you'll remember back I said there was a computer in 2005 2007 one in 2012 okay those were funded under that model um, now we've actually been, through this process we've been able to say well we're bringing you know it's our research our users these researchers are bringing in this money so now we actually have a sustainable mechanism for tapping into funds and so that over a period of about five years we'll end up with some number seven to ten ten million dollars um, so that's the way we're going forward there's also the other funding model uh, like Jetstream where the federal government pays us money but I've already described that distinction between an IU system and IU users getting it and the national infrastructure so it more or less just repeating uh, the advanced cyber infrastructure stuff that's the computers uh, and data storage systems visualization we talked about that we're using some of UC's Viz services here now uh, community engagement uh, and research software. These are all important ports, important points that um, you know UC needs to be figuring out ways to do some of this. And one of the things that I've noticed um, is that a lot of these things are popping up organically, like the um, statistics software. We got a whole group of four people that just deal with statistical software packages, SPSS and things like this. Okay, and they're experts and a large number of faculty members doing research need to do statistics which they may or may not know okay so I heard uh, just yesterday that uh, I think it was the Department of Mathematics has started a tut tutoring uh, tutorial or um, a um, office hours for people that want to do uh, some advice on statistics so there's bits, I keep hearing bits and pieces of that. And it, at Indiana University, we tried to pull it under one umbrella. But the need is here. Everybody's seeing it. And they're organically doing some of this stuff themselves. Um, white cows in a snowstorm. <laughs> um, this is a really old graphic, but it does show we started out about the turn of the century. We were all base funded. This is red stuff is base funding. So that's essentially money that's been allocated by the legislature or whatever. Um, so over time, though, you can see that we're about one net, and this statistic is probably still true. About one third of our personnel funding uh, comes from grants, uh, and two thirds of it is. Um, again that base funding so we have to get out there and beat the bushes and come up with the grants and stuff like that or we get written into a grant when a faculty member submits a grant they're going to pay so much time to our research uh, to research technology personnel to work on our project we do some of that um, this is sort of a cool slide this is the different departments that use our services and how much they have been using this. And my vision's not very good. So starting in the upper left corner, is the blue there is physics in Bloomington. Now, IU has eight campuses. We have two major research campuses, Bloomington and Indianapolis. So these are actually broken out by uh, campuses. So that's Bloomington physics, the light blue. Um, Bloomington chemistry is the purple there. Um, let's see. This is Indianapolis bio. So this is the bioinformaticians and stuff. 
uh, we have a really big biology department in Bloomington. This one sort of surprised me, but this is picking up the medical school in Indianapolis, the medical schools in Indianapolis. This is computer science. Uh, this is Indianapolis physics, so comparing Bloomington physics to Indianapolis physics. Um, this is Indianapolis engineering. Uh, uh, Indian, the Indianapolis campus is, uh, is in, IU and Purdue have gone together. IU is an arts and sciences uh, college, and Purdue is the engineering. So um, this is the engineers from Purdue on our at, at Indianapolis. Um, where's the one? Is it engineering, Bloomington Bio. There's. Uh, it's the English department I'm looking for. I thought it was the brown one. These colors are different. Anyways, in the last graphic I was looking at, the, this statistic is different. This, where this, this blue was, that was the English department. Okay, using our research. So IU has, um, we tried to not, whenever we use the term research computing, uh, we also try to say re creative activities, trying to pull in these communities so that it's not just a bunch of nerdy, you know, physicists using these computers. It really is the entire uh, community. Um, so here's some of these statistics. $380 million in grants came in last year, physical year 19. We're in 20 now. 45% um, of that was funded research. So these are from the use, this is that statistic I was talking about before. These, these are the dollars that researchers using our systems are bringing in. And that's how we were able to go make that argument that um, we should be getting some of this. We work with 153 different departments, you know, English, whatever. Um, 331 academic disciplines. Um, and the rest of this is just probably not of much interest. UC, where are we with UC? Where is that heading? So there's the URL. If you're not aware of what uh, UC's activities are, this is the place to go look. Uh, this is the web site that Amy, who just stepped out, set up. So, um, so the view from the trenches uh, here at UC, I have to point to uh, Jane Combs. Uh, if you can't see it, somebody's getting ready to pull a pin on a hand grenade and light this place up. <laughs> Okay, so that's Jane. Too bad she couldn't be here to, to see this one. Um, and other people that I've been working with, uh, Amy, who stepped out, Larry Shirtman, um, I think a lot of people know Larry. Adam Steele is from the uh, UCIT group, so he's a assistant men over there that's been giving us a great deal of help. Um, I also need to um, mention the uh, Faculty Advisory Committee, and Prashant's the chair. Um, uh, so um, they're doing a lot of good work. They need your support. Go back to your departments, tell your chairs that we don't have enough resources. You need to go complain to the dean. And um, we'll get this done. Questions? I ran five minutes long, so... Well, no, it took us nine minutes to get started, so I apologize for that. Questions? Yes, sir. Can you do any uh, support any state or local or business-related cybersecurity efforts internal to the IU Red System itself? Or is any of that dedicated to like cybersecurity analytics or um, or any that kind of thing? A user eligible to use our system could be doing that. I don't know it, but um, uh, and when I had the slide up for the PTI Pervasive Technology Institute, and I mentioned the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, mm -hmm. they would be doing that. Um, I I don't think they use a lot of our resources, but um, they could. So, so follow on question then: mm -hmm. How do you maintain the? How do you protect your own system, particularly on the ITAR side? Where we don't do ITAR. We're just now, um, we're starting to work with a researcher from Notre Dame. And um, for government um, funding from, from DOD, 
um, they have what they call 6-1, 6-2, and 6-3 funding. So 6-1 is basic research. So we can take 6-1 funding because that's just basic physics on our systems. So we're working with this hypersonics researcher at Notre Dame and he's just working on the basic physics of hypersonics flight. When you start talking 6-2, that's when you start developing products and 6-3 funding is actually producing something that will go out into the field. So the basic physics we can do. Somebody that's going to do 6-2 funding, that's a, that becomes a geometry problem. So, okay, what's the geometry of the nacelles or the geometry of the combustion chambers and stuff like that? So they can take the basic research we've done and then go off to other resources. So, unwinding this stack. We don't do ITAR, um, but we're going to have to get into that business. So, um, What about CUI? CUI? Yeah, Controlled Unclassified Information. Um, it's because uh, ITAR is a subcategory of 12 of those categories. Yes. And so if you're able to handle FISMA on this system, usually it's adapted to be able to handle CUI, which ITAR would fall underneath as one of the categories under okay. CUI. Because you're saying no, nothing on ITAR within this cluster. Are you able to do CUI data? Because there's a lot more grants and contracts coming out with that. Um, we are work not at this point. We put a lot of effort up till... I would say that a year ago, maybe two years ago, it was all HIPAA focused. But now we're FISMA focused because HIPAA is actually less stringent than the, the FISMA stuff. And the FISMA is the same as CUI. Okay. And then we control ITAR as well. We're working towards becoming FISMA medium. Okay. So, but we're not there yet. Because that would be able to handle ITAR control okay. data as well because it's a category under 12. Because I'm the export controls director, so I, I know this I'd love to go to lunch with you, something to explain <laughs> this to me, you know. Yes, yeah. so it's like subcategory, so under the ITAR, it's a basic regulation that states that you will just secure it. Right. And how you secure it is how you justify how you secure it. So CUI right. data, so the DFAR clause says controlled unclassified information, uh -huh. and they call it CUI data. And the CUI data that all universities are having problems with trying to control within the regulations are coming down through contracts. And a lot right. of the contracts are stating how you're going to control it. And ITAR is just one little piece. But FISMA requires that same amount of control as CUI. Right. And so it's been, a, it's been a discussion at UC for years now um, when they started saying this was coming down the pike in 2013. So we've been looking at it and talking about it. And so part of it is trying to figure out how this, if you, if you guys are meeting FISMA, then it might be able to help. We're we don't meet it, no. Okay, but you're getting this is how UC is going to pay Indiana back for me coming <laughs> over and doing. <laughs> you and I need to go have lunch, and yeah, maybe dinner, that. but I yeah, because yeah, we're here because I'm I'm very fascinated on how people are doing it. Yeah, it's uh, we're getting there because it's really difficult for universities across the nation. Yes, to be able to meet these and with the new government requirements that the subcontractors have to be held to the same standards. Right. Yes. So. Yeah, and it's getting worse because some of this stuff isn't even export. Control. Like mm -hmm. it's just, they just want to control it because it doesn't fall in to the export control regulations, so they put it under controlled un controlled unclassified, unclassified information, and so yeah. they fall underneath there, and they have like twelve categories of information. So yeah. All under there. No, we're in that panic mode. So okay. we've got, you know, I don't want to pick on people above me, but, no. you know, they're using words that, you know, right. we have to implement down here. So, right. um, and uh, nobody really knows what to, but, um, for um, for the HIPAA stuff, a lot of it was just, again, repeating myself, was documenting what we were already doing. We were doing the right thing, yeah. but, you know, like for uh, the ITAR data where you have to grind up the disk, we don't do that. We just encrypt them or throw them away or whatever. So now we have to implement those three or four other steps that would bring us within FISMA um, oh. compliance. So. Yeah, no, I'd love to get lunch Oh yeah, I, I come over every couple of months or so. So, uh, Jane and Amy know my yeah, schedule. Yeah, I know them all. I know Jane very well. Yes, sir. Um, on UC's cluster, how does the priority structure look like uh, for running jobs on the cluster? Um, Larry can correct me, but uh, we use a fair share scheduling algorithm. So what that means is that if you have three people in the job that submit a job to run, 
one person's used the cluster a whole lot and some's used a little, little bit and one's used it none. The one that has used it none will have the first dispatch priority. Okay, so this is how you make it fair. Like I was saying at IU, um, an incoming uh, English undergraduate has the same compute uh, access as a tenured faculty member. Okay, everybody is equal. So uh, the person that uses the compute most is the least likely to get their next job dispatched. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, a follow up to that. We ran into the problem when we started running on the ARCC. So one of the issues we are having is someone needs to run like you know 10 cases and they need like you know 300 cores or something, while another person just needs 10 or fewer than that. How do you prioritize that? Because the guy who's using 10 cores is doing a one-time job or a two-time job, so and this guy needs like all the time. So how are you going to prioritize that? Um, boy, religious wars have been started over this. <laughs> Part of the problem is really having enough resources to handle that. The problem we have with the ARC is that it is so small that uh, if you get more than two or three users on there, you're already exceeding the capacity of the system. Now at IU, um, our typical systems, we may have 600 users on them. We're just about the same size as UC. Okay, um, I think you see Jane and I did some statistics uh, for the vice president of research, and UC comes in at about 85 percent, 80 percent of the size as far as faculty and students of IU. So um, we have maybe 600 users on the system. 200 of them are active, you, you know, at any given time. So they come and they go. But that's the problem with the UC is that. We have departments at IU, even with the resources we have, we have departmental clusters that are larger than the ARC. So, you know, it's... Uh, so you mean UC? Departmental clusters? Yeah. No, we have, we have clusters in the departments at IU, too. You know, um, less so now. Did I mention IT28? I, I've talked to so many people so many times, I forget who I've told what to. Um, we had a lot of these department, departmental clusters spread around. Some of them are tied with instruments like microscopes or telescopes and things like that. So um, those are sort of dedicated to the instrument. Uh, it used to be whenever a faculty member come in, you know, they take their startup funds and like, oh, I'm going to go spend it all on a computer and stick it in some closet. And um, departments get audited. So just randomly, you know, uh, Department of Economics gets audited. So the auditors all come in, they check everything in the department, and, time, and these audit reports then go to the Board of Trustees. Time and time again, insecure computer facilities were being found under people's desks or in closets and things like that. And the CIO just got tired of having to explain why these security hazards are, are there. So we implemented uh, IT policy 28 about maybe five years ago now. Um, and that essentially said if you have a resource that you need to have in your department, you have to convince your dean. The dean has to sign off on it, okay? Um, but it's something like, uh, you know, you're plugged into a microscope, that's an easy sell. If it's a resource just like the central computing, uh, you know, it might be a harder sell, um, wasting the dean's time. So um, those have been going down over time. Some of those people, uh, they had two options, three options. They could buy into the, our central systems. This is the condo model where I want to buy 10 nodes. I'm going to, whatever you're buying, I want to buy 10 of them. Um, and then I have some dispatch priority. Uh, on so I can jump to the head of the queue because my advisor bought access, okay? Uh, you can do the colo, which you actually buy nodes and stick them in our cluster, and but you have to pay sysadmin fees because you want something different. you got to have a special version of the software or the operating system or something. You can't use our, our standard stuff, okay? That's the colo model. We have a second colo model where you can actually take your servers and stick them in racks in the data center I showed above. So um, that's the way we deal with that. But um, I'm sorry. One step at a time. Yes, yes. We're, it's growing. Well, the mere fact that we're talking about cluster number two and cluster number three is not too far of a distant vision. So there's 
scholarly archive that you mentioned about is that automated job, uh, data transfer between your primary spinning disks to that tape drive or is it from that? No, it's human in the loop type. Well, people write scripts, so it's not supposed to be used for backup, but I know a lot of things get backed up to that by batch scripts doing tar and so the, the SCP. You can do it at this manual, is that right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, there's no real automated. We, we are looking for something like that. But. Yeah. Well, somebody writes a script to automate it, so what happens? Yeah, but that's there's not any pointy clicky type thing. Well, even on the desktop thingy I showed, there's access to that storage, but it's just invoking a script that somebody highlight these files and SCP is one common way you can uh, also use uh, they have special parallel um, tar copying commands so the desktop part is it Citrix or what is it, is it something else or? Uh, it's not Citrix it's ThinLink yeah which is very similar so um, you're just uh, on your laptop you're running a VNC client uh, on the server, the, uh, you're running a VNC server. This thin link layer just is very efficient at providing lots of those connections. Yeah. So, yes, sir. What is the latency you have seen when you implemented, implemented the desktops? Oh, I have no idea. Um, if you're talking about latency from the time I hit return, that I see it yeah. return back on the. Um, it. Uh, I don't know is the honest answer, but it's got to be sub-second. I mean, if it's, humans are latency intolerant, so if it's, there's very much latency, they get irritable. If it's just a shell, it runs faster, right? But if you're using a GUI to push it, it's bandwidth Well, that's why we use ThinLink, okay? It's very efficient at moving the pixels. So you're not updating a whole screen with each paint, but you're only updating the pixels that change, like when you move that, or when you, if you're running an animation, whenever the animation changes. So that's why we use the thin link. Will you be using that on the arc, or? Um, I don't know. When you get big enough, yep, yeah, I would imagine. I, it's, it has proved to be so popular that uh, we would be uh, um, remiss if we did not implement something like that. It's just so popular. You will have to do it. So it's going to be down the line? Huh? It's going to be down the line? Um, down the line in time. When you, yeah, when you have, well, like I said, um, we're running 45 servers to support that desktop. You don't have 45 servers, so <laughs> we're getting there, though. We're getting there. Yeah. Any other questions? So these uh, desktops, they are separate from the actual cluster that runs bad jobs, or is it part of it? They're part of the Karst cluster. So we have Big Red, Karst, Carbonate, um, and a subsection of the Karst cluster. Um, usually if you have a compute cluster you have head nodes and management nodes where users log into and then the back of it is where all the computing takes place. A subset of those compute nodes are being used to, so we're having to peel off compute resources to handle the... Um, so they're not, the desktop systems are not scheduled the same way, they are basically no. outside of it. Yes. Time exactly. Well, a week. They actually will, they get, they can only run seven days. And so then they die. And so you come in next Monday, you have to re-log in. Okay. And one other thing we do at IU is that we have a, a the first Tuesday of the month is a maintenance day. Because you've got networks, you've got storage devices, multiple storage devices, you've got multiple compute resources. Um, and these are all interlinked. So if one system goes down, everybody else is essentially dead. So what we have done is started going to a coordinated scheduling or first Tuesday of the month, okay? Um, and, you know, anybody who's been in computing long enough would say, why aren't you doing that Sunday morning at, you know, midnight? And, well, you need your people to be smart and awake because they can do, they're playing with dangerous things and they can break things really easily. Two, when you get these large systems, you have thousands of nodes 
and you can't pay for 24 by 7 maintenance on them, okay? So we have a Monday through Friday, uh, next business day, maintenance contract. So that's why we do maintenance. We started off on Monday, first Monday of the month. There are three-day holidays, so you don't want to do it on Monday. We learn very quickly, so that's why it's Tuesday. Um, yeah. So this is for operating system updates and things like that? Or? Yes, patches. Um, that's sort of a good point. Um, depending upon the severity of the patches, like if it's an emergency kernel or a remote exploit, we will patch our systems in 24 hours. If you're a researcher running, your job died because we're going to take it down and we're going to re-patch uh, those systems. If there are um, you know, low priority issues, then we'll wait till the next maintenance day. And yeah, we update the RPMs. A lot of times, uh, like the storage system might be Luster or GPFS and they'll want to upgrade because they're having problems. We need to upgrade the client on our side. So these things are all coordinated. So. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just curious. At, uh, at IU, how do you manage, um, how do you handle the different people from different departments using uh, different software? Um, good. That's good. Uh, good question. Okay, I'm going to break that into two different sections. There's. Um, uh, licensed software. IU actually uh, license a lot of this software uh, university wide. So it could be university wide or campus wide. Um, but we go ahead and usually it's university wide for all eight campuses. Um, uh, as far as um, unlicensed software, well, also, um, if it's licensed to like a particular department or maybe even one researcher, we use Unix groups to control that access. Um, as far as software support in general, um, and this is something that uh, UC will need to be thinking about, is that we have a group, well, I mentioned quite heavily the statistical uh, software group, but we actually have a group of people that uh, support researchers in the department and their sources, source code, optimizing it, compiling it, things like that. So that said, Another type of software is like software that you're going to download off the internet somewhere, the, the, the community codes that I had mentioned before. If one or two per people are going to use that, that group will work with that researcher to compile and install it in their account. Okay. If more than three or four people are going to use it, then we will install it in a central location so that everybody has access to it. And then we use modules, if you know what that is, so that a uh, user can update their environment and pull that software into their environment. So it's a multi-layered sort of what's the need and how much effort do we have to put into fulfilling it. So, so how do you manage these software updates, the, the compiled ones, right? Do you have some sort of a mailing list that you manage? Who uses what so you know targeted audience to tell them? Yep. This one's well, with the modules, we can have more than one version on the system. So a lot of times, you know, the newer version will be installed, it'll be tested, um, and then the default module will be updated on those maintenance days. So like everything changes on those maintenance days. And then we send out a, an email, a newsletter to the users the first of the month saying these are the changes that are being made. Um, so one thing we did was whenever the module command is run, in the cluster, uh -huh. we actually captured the database who used it, which module, which version. So when the newest update comes, we know a short list of people who need to know. That's a good idea. It's more focused. and yeah. yeah, I'm sure we're all of our eyes glaze over when those automated emails come, you know. I, uh, yeah, yeah, D, 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 D. That's how I was going to fund my retirement. There's a few people over here old enough to remember that uh, you, you had the, the old keyboards, you know, the mechanical keyboards. And I was going to retire my fund, or fund my retirement by creating a titanium D key, D, 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 D. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. It's always fun coming over here, working with you guys. So uh, thanks for coming. I hope you learned something interesting, both about what we do at IU and about what uh, UC is trying to do here. So Amy. Thank you, George. Thank you. Um, we have some lunch. George is going to stick around.